Welcome to It's Our Money with Ellen Brown, a look behind the curtain of global finance and monetary control with one of the foremost experts in the field. Author of the bestseller Web of Debt and the Public Bank Solution, Ellen Brown's groundbreaking work began the movement to create new American public banks. We'll look at issues surrounding the world of money and the systems and powers that control it, as well as the progress being made on the public banking frontier. The program is underwritten by Public Banking Associates, a national consultancy of experts advising government leaders pursuing the creation of their own public banks at publicbankingassociates.com. Hello, and welcome to It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. I'm Walt McCree, Ellen's co-host and senior advisor to the Public Banking Institute. Today, we're going to forego our usual banter about things that are happening in the world of money and the economy to spend a full hour with one of the most engaging historians and authors, Matthew Errett, who has a remarkable way of putting our economic evolution into a historical framework that not only exposes the many vagaries of the system that we've inherited, but also digs into the deeper philosophical underpinnings that has brought us to this point. His new book, called The Clash of Two Americas, lays out a clear view of the political and oligarchic pressures that have shaped today's global monetary system and our political systems, and why we remain in a revolutionary struggle to reclaim the power of our own sovereignty and our sovereign currency for the service of the public well-being, rather than the profit of elite political and economic forces. You'll hear how the principles of public service and democracy faced off against the ruling monetary power structures from the time of early American history, and you'll see how little has changed in the meantime, and also how the opportunities for change are better than ever if we, the people, are willing to stand together to repossess them. Here's Ellen. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be uh, speaking again to Matthew Errett, who is a prolific Canadian author and uh, speaker and editor-in-chief of the Canadian Patriot Review and co-founder of the Montreal-based Rising Tide Foundation. Besides copious articles, he has authored four volumes of the Untold History of Canada book series and has a new book out, which essentially continues that series called the Clash of Two Americas, Volume One, The Unfinished Sister Symphony. So there's still a Volume Two coming out. So that's great. Yeah. And I guess your book is available on your website, which is CanadianPatriot.org. And I know it's on Amazon too for anybody who uses Amazon. Okay. Yeah. So great to speak to you. I I actually meant to just skim your book so I could ask intelligent questions. And it was so interesting. I wound up reading practically the whole thing. I'm going blind here, but <laughs> I got through it. It was great. It was really interesting for me. I mean, I consider myself, you know, an expert on American history and, and uh, <clears throat> there are lots of things I didn't know. And it explained lots of things I didn't, you know, they added new light through new light on old issues. So that was great. Um, and it's cool to me that you're you're Canadian and yet you've taken such an interest in American history. But then, as you point out, Canada was could have been or might, you know, the plan of Benjamin Franklin and his cohort of his colleagues was to bring Canada in among many other countries. And, and that didn't work out. So um, so you can talk about that as you will. But um, I just I wanted to start with your title, uh, The Clash of Two Americas, which is provocative, and The Unfinished Symphony, which is provocative. So do you want to say what the two Americas are and what what the, you know, what's not finished here? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And again, it, it's always great to chat with you, Ellen. Um, Thank you uh, for providing the platform for this dialogue to happen. And I, I hope that some of your viewers uh, get something out of this. Um, I know for myself as a Canadian, it, it might even, I, I often get a lot of Americans who express what you just said. And they're like, well, how, how is it that you're so uh, concerned about American, America, hi, American history? 
Um, and, you know, sometimes it, it's useful to just get out of your field of comfort, your perception uh, as an American looking at your own history. And sometimes just having another person, whether a European or whether an Asian or whether a Canadian um, looking gives uh, sometimes a new dimension, a new, a new element to appreciate the context. Um, since Canada itself, a lot of people take for granted that this just exists as a nation, that they're all, you know, they look at the globe and they're like, okay, there's these nation states in the world with these cultural dynamics in each nation state. And it's just sort of, um, they just happen to be there and it's taken as, as an a priori fact. But the evolution of how this came to be uh, is, is often not fresh in people's minds. So why is there a Canada? Why is there a monarchy of the North in North America? the only country that has a monarchy in all of the Americas. Why? Um, we are, by all intents and purposes, very American. I don't, you know, if you asked a, a, a Slovakian to detect which, which one you or me was American and which Canadian, I, I don't think they would, they, they would find it very easy. Um, so no, our, one word that Canadians say that I can always tell it's Canadian, but other than that, it's like indistinguishable. What's Agreed. the word? Is it eight? I don't remember when I hear, if I hear you say it, I'll, I'll tell you, or what's one sound, you know, <laughs> What's <laughs> <Sorry. in a laughs> but you know, so, I just, I hear people and then, you know, they're talking along and all of a sudden I just hear this sound and I go, ah, yeah, there's, Canadian. there's tells, there's tells you could get, but overall it's, it's, it's difficult, especially, you know, we, we come from a similar cultural dynamic. You know, we watch similar movies, shows, music, speak the same language for the most part. I'm here in Quebec where we speak two languages. Um, but how did this all happen? Why is it? Why are we a separate country? Um, and you refer you inferred uh, very quickly to one of the early chapters in my new book, um, The Clash of the Two Americas. I, I have a hard copy here, uh, The Unfinished Symphony. And I try to address that. And I try to do that from the standpoint of looking at the past, not from the standpoint simply of documenting things that happened, but rather seeing that history is shaped by aborted potentials on, on the one hand. So potentials that were moving into being, that were being actualized, but were aborted. And at, uh, on the other hand, um, tragedies, things that, that should not have happened, which did happen. So, and, that, and then a third, I would add a third category of things that likely were never gonna happen, potentials that were almost impossible. If you were a gambler, you would not have guessed that the US revolution was gonna be a success when you had a bunch of farmers with no industry in, in the colonies, <laughs> rebel against the biggest empire in the world, right? A global force. Um, you would have been like, no way, my money's on the British empire. But that potential ended up actualizing. So you have the, those things too. And you have these, so there's sort of a dynamic interplay. Um, it's not, looking at Canada from that standpoint um, was a journey. It took many years of research. I pulled together a, a, mag, a news magazine on uh, called the CanadianPatriot.org. Uh, back in 2012 to start publishing some of the historical research and some of the geopolitical analysis associated with that. Um, some of your work um, on web of debt and public banking came in very handy in trying to understand how the Bank of Canada uh, was taken down. How, how did it come to being? How was it taken down? How could it be reactivated uh, to fund infrastructure um, in our modern age? So all of that was very useful. But the broader question still remained, why are we not part of the, the United States? Um, now, a lot of Canadians would be like, well, thank God we're not. And sure enough, when you do look at the United States' behavior in recent decades, you can't blame somebody for saying, thank God we're not, uh, because... Well, that's, that's part of the unfinished symphony. So what you're yeah. saying is we didn't actually manifest what we set out to manifest. I mean, what I really liked about your, or one thing I liked besides all the facts that I didn't know, what is, is that it... Um, you know, it restores our faith in what America was all about and what it was intended to be. And it didn't get there, but it didn't get there because it got subverted by those. Uh, I mean, as Lincoln and Henry Carey said, it, it, you know, you've got two systems. That's what you said, in fact, the clash of two Americas. So the two Americas, do you want to define what that is? I mean, it was sure. yeah. the British okay. system, the imperialist influence, which was yeah. largely financial that just kept cutting in and cutting us off and make, doing all those things that we've got a bad name for. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, and, and that's where 
Um, it's an important lesson for Canadians as well as Americans to, to re recall that the American Revolution, though it lasted for six years, it finally had a peace treaty in 1783 in Paris. It was never a final product. It, it um, you know, yes, you you had Ben Franklin, his his loyal allies who who shared a vision for creating a new type of government founded upon the consent of the governed, the general welfare, which was the foundation of the Constitution in 1787, and the principle of the inalienable rights of each individual, uh, no regard whatsoever for hereditary class. Um, that I mean, the the idea of organizing society around hereditary power structures is entirely the foundation of every type of government that had ever existed before 1776. Um, so sometimes you could have a more benevolent king or you know monarch that would give of some more liberties than others to a colony or another. But the idea of conceptually was that those liberties could, were given by the consent of only one sovereign. There's only one sovereign being that gave or could take away inversely your liberties. In the United States, that was the, it was the first time a nation was, was organized around a different idea that everybody was sovereign, not just one, like the Canadian system. Um, and, and so the entire political economy was expected to emanate that truth. And it, it is a truth. It's, it's, a, it's, it's founded in, in, in an idea of natural law. So out of, coming out of the 1783, and the, the, the picture on the book is from Benjamin West, uh, an American painter from Philadelphia who ended up becoming president of the British Royal Academy of Fine Arts, which is a whole story unto itself. Uh, he was um, a close friend of Benjamin Franklin. And on it, you have the American delegation, but it's an unfinished painting. And the British refused to sit for that painting because in their minds, in the minds of people like Lord Shelburne, they didn't really truly accept the terms of conditions of the American claim for independence. The idea was always to recapture it at some future time. So they didn't show up. And so it was an unfinished painting, but I think it speaks loudly and, and it's very appropriate. Basically you have Benjamin Franklin sitting at a painting with um, John Adams, his nephew, a couple of others, uh, John Jay um, in Paris for the signing of the peace treaty of the, the peace of Paris and the painter is Benjamin West. The, the point is that when you look at what happened in the ensuing years, especially after Ben Franklin died, you had um, groupings of American Americans that said early on they were not going to be a part of the revolution and that they instead preferred to be a part of the British Empire. Um, and that encompassed the city of London as the international financial hub around the Bank of England that to this very day remains an international node of control. Um, it implied also British intelligence and, and everything that went with the British East India Company, eventually the growth of the opium trade and other things. Uh, money laundering, the slave trade was largely driven economically by this structure. Um, so one group said they wanted to be a part and remain loyal to that. That became the British uh, Empire, uh, uh, United Empire Loyalists, who became English-speaking Canada. You had some Canadians, uh, some French Canadians, who wanted to be a part of the revolution. And that's when Benjamin Franklin was up here organizing. And uh, they were basically threatened with excommunication and burning in hellfire for eternity by Bishop Briand and a bunch of Jesuits who were loyal to the British uh, way of doing things and basically said, if anybody fights with Washington, yeah, you're gonna burn for hell, burn in hell forever. So that dissuaded more than a few farmers from joining the cause. And it certainly dissuaded any delegates from being formed to go to the American Constitutional Convention in 1776. So you had the, the those who just left, they, they became English speaking Canada and uh, loyalists that, that created its own oligarchy around what later be call, became called the family compact and had its own, um, I mean, you know, to this very day, a lot of these same family structures and institutions remain power, you know, very powerful in Canada. The other group that remained loyal to the British remained behind and simply said, okay, a lot of them found themselves inside of Hamilton's Federalist Party, um, not Hamilton. And I make that point in the book that Hamilton was stood out from his own party um, because he was loyal to Ben Franklin's vision, but they basically said, we are going to work to subvert the United States from within. And from there, we have the groupings around the, um, you know, the Cabot family, the Eastern Blue Blood Establishment, what, what sometimes were called the Boston Brahmins. Um, they call them the Brahmins because in India, that's the highest, highest caste, right? Um, so you, you had this grouping that essentially organized themselves very, very much around not just Burr, but an entire web of British assets inside of America to take down the United States from within. And this became sort of the bane of America's existence 
uh, that to this very I day see. has not been purged. And that's the second America. So there's two Americas at war with each other, a legitimate one. And you usually, usually could tell, you could see its representatives by the fact that they're, when they achieve the presidency, they, they don't live through their terms of office. And there's been eight presidents who did not make it through, whether by bullets or whether by very mysterious circumstances, likely poisoning. Um, and you'll find that usually they're doing something very, very similar to each other, even though they're separated by many uh, decades apart. And they were all in favor of the American system versus the British system. Yeah. That it, that's the common denominator, and that is the punchline well, of the well, a, Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want to list them? So, I mean, I think I. Sure, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'll see what I can do. I'll, I'll, I'll see how my memory works here. <laughs> but you have definitely uh, the first American president uh, to die was a Whig president named uh, Harrison, William Harrison in 1840, who had the draft for a reactivation of a third, like the, the, the renewal of a third national bank on his desk. It had been passed in both the Senate and the Congress. Um, so it was about to happen. He was about to sign off on it when he died after only three months in office. Uh, both John Quincy Adams and Abraham Lincoln campaigned vigorously for his success after a tumultuous period uh, of a Jackson presidency as well as a Van Buren presidency, which unfortunately, even though both characters, especially Jackson, are, are somewhat overly celebrated in our modern age for having paid off the dead. And, you know, you hear these different mythologies about how Jackson went to war with the big bankers, the big international proto federal reserve private bankers and, and beat the bank. And that's what's on his tombstone. No, it's that's a mythology cooked up by those very same bankers who took control of the United States under Jackson. And you could just see the way what he did is he did kill. He did pay the debt. It's true by cutting all investment into big infrastructure projects and simply putting that all into paying the debt. But it's like what the IMF has, has expected of all countries, you know, including Greece and others, that if they're going to get a loan, they, they have to have conditionalities to pay the debt and stop investing in infrastructure. Um, so that's what sort of happened. The, U, the U.S. ground to a halt and it became a speculative frenzy where every state was given the right to issue their own currencies. Anyway, that's a whole story. And, and you asked me a question of uh, the list of, of dead presidents. So Harrison, not to, to keep myself on track here. So Harrison was the first to die after three months. Um, you had the Whigs okay. reorganizing. Can I just interject? Yeah. So, so my great, great, great grandfather yeah. was named William Henry Harrison Miles. And he fought at Gettysburg and he homesteaded, you know, 160 acres in Pennsylvania. So, you know, so I feel all warm and attached to all that. But but I just heard I say you this video. I just heard today that the problem with the Homestead Act, but this is a totally different uh, subject, is that it, all those Western um, settlers were moving in on property that we didn't really own. I mean, it was that indigenous peoples that were being invaded. One of the themes of your book is <laughs> that uh, this whole movement about rewriting American history, that it was all rich white men taking away the lands of poor people and enslaving poor people and that sort of thing. I think the two biggest threats to the truth of history uh, is two bad habits of historiography. On the one hand, of, try of those historians who uh, try to paint everything from a standpoint of the U.S. is an angelic country that's perfect. It's a, like the American Revolution is a done deal. It happened. The U.S. is now the best. And uh, everything that, you know, so they'll, they'll sort of paint every core singularity in history after 1776 as America was, was completely great. And they'll overlook all sorts of very ugly, disturbing things that were done in America's name. And that leads you all the way up through the, the assassinations of world leaders in South America, Operation Condor. It'll, you know, you'll just ignore all sorts of stuff in, in the Middle East, in Africa, and you name it. So, and then the other hand, you have the very cynical narratives that only are capable of looking at everything from the standpoint of uh, America is evil. It's always been evil, and it always will be evil, and it's kind of good that it collapses. So... And there can, that, that narrative, that filter is incapable of receiving anything positive that might contradict that very, very solid assumption that is unbreakable. And you have from there things like the 1619 Project, uh, which I think a great example that premises itself on the narrative that, you know, America was entirely always built not on, on slavery, number one, 
on the expansion of slavery, the empowerment of the slave master and all basically white European males who are in America are intrinsically just spreading their, their vile poisonous desire to dominate all weaker genders and races, and thus that, that must be overthrown. And there's an inability to often see any, well, good virtuous white yeah. European males who didn't believe in that, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, that's another great theme in your book that, uh, you know, Lincoln and Kerry and uh, the heroes that were celebrated, uh, Franklin were definitely anti-slavery and Lincoln really did fight the Civil War to free the slaves and not just to preserve the union, as some people say. When I got to, you quoted um, Frederick Doug Douglass, who was uh, one of the few emancipated slaves who could actually read and write. And I mean, it was quite moving to me. And I, I got choked up reading what he said. Well, that, that brought tears to my eye too. And, and actually I first mentioned that was my, my wife, because she, my wife, Cynthia Chung, who's also a writer at Strategic Culture with me, uh, wrote two of the chapters in the book. And that was hers. Uh, she brought that to my attention after reading Frederick Douglass's autobiography. And yeah, you could just really recognize that the entire idea, and it's so popular that Lincoln really didn't care about slaves or freeing the slaves. He just really cared about freeing the union or saving the union, which is an off-sighted uh, quote. It's completely taken out of context and it ignores the entire life's work of Lincoln going back to the 1830s as a lawyer and as a young congressman uh, working with John Quincy Adams where he was always fighting against the institution of slavery. He always, um, it just so happened to be at that moment, this was leading up to or during the civil war that that quote uh, occurred. He was making the point simply that if you allow the United States to dissolve as the union is concerned and, and undo the constitution and undo the declaration and, and all of that, the ability to stop slavery is gonna be forever gone. Like forget about it. At that point, if you have a neat, like a dissolved union with, a pro, pro British. Slave he's also fighting a political, you know, fight with constituencies who don't necessarily have his views that he needs to still have their support. So often, what a political uh, statesman will say publicly is versus what they're thinking are not the same thing, and that's something a lot of people naively or romantically uh, ignore. In real politic, it's it's you uh, you have to look at what the person's actions are over what simply they say, because often what they say is deflection from what their higher intention is. Otherwise, no good guy would, no good guy or girl or whatever in history would ever succeed at fighting empire, ever. Yeah, so, and Douglas said, you know, having met him several times, that he was convinced of his sincerity and that it was really all about freeing the slaves and that that was really important to him. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. You asked me about the other dead presidents. Do you wanna do you wanna go through the list? Oh, sure, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so I'll just keep it straight. So you have then Zachary Taylor, um, 1851. Um, he was also another Whig who died very, very quickly. According to historians, the official cause of death was bad uh, milk and cherries. Um, and then uh, obviously we all know Lincoln in 1865, which I have a whole chapter on going through the role of British operations in Canada on that one uh, that ran and deployed John Wilkes Booth from from Montreal. There's a whole story about that. Then obviously you have uh, Garfield in 1880, around the same time, a little bit before Tsar Alexander II also was killed by a British connected anarchist cell in, in uh, Moscow. Then you have the vice president of McKinley who dies, uh, but he uh, likely died by arsenic. I mean, he had all the symptoms of arsenic poisoning, but that opened up the door for Teddy Roosevelt to become his, his vice president in 18, I think it was 98 or 99. And at which point, as soon as Teddy Roosevelt was in, who was a complete Anglophile pro KKK uh, bombastic figure, he was a tool. Um, at that point, there was nothing really keeping McKinley alive and he was eliminated in 1901. And he was the last Lincoln Republican. You know, and his assassin was, again, tied to a, a terrorist, an anarchist network tied to Emma Goldwyn, um, who was herself tied to British intelligence. It was Bertrand Russell who uh, got her out of prison, actually running the uh, Neo-Malthusian League that they were both a part of. It's very interesting that I'd like to get into. <laughs> Sorry. Then you got Warren Harding, 1923, also fighting to bring back the protective tariff, a lot of national banking policies. Um, and he's eliminated by eating bad oysters. FDR, very su suspicious circumstances in 1945, April 12th. He didn't get to live out his last term um, or see through a lot of the post-war plans that he had worked on 
with his allies in Russia and in China or other parts of the world. So he didn't get to see that through his allies like Henry Wallace and Dexter White ended up uh, either dying mysteriously like Dexter White or being run out of government uh, for being pro, you know, like Soviet agents or something. Um, Stalin himself had gone on record to Roosevelt's son saying that your father's death was caused by poisoning by Churchill's gang. And then finally, um, JFK, everyone um, has, I think, uh, a memory and a connection to JFK's um, untimely murder and cover up, um, followed by his brother, who was in all likelihood going to be the, pri uh, the president uh, if he had been permitted to survive <laughs> the coming months after yeah. 1968. There was also in 1912, the, um, the first uh, central bank was formed in Australia that was actually using the American system of just issuing the money and it was uh, Australia thrived, they funded their participation in World War One and all these um, industries were developed and he died mysteriously of food poisoning. Mm -hmm. So. Yes. And that was a Hamiltonian bank. The founder of that of the Australian National Bank was a, a follower of Alexander Hamilton, was spreading Alexander uh, Alexander Hamilton's writings across the, the Australian establishment. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And in Canada at that time as well, you had uh, Wilfrid Laurier, who was trying to move in that direction. He was a great lover of Abraham Lincoln, who was Laurier was pr uh, prime minister for about 14 years from the 1890s, and he was ousted in 1911. But he loved Lincoln. He wanted to apply a protective tariff and emit large scale credit for big infrastructure development. He foresaw a Canadian population of 60 million in a highly electrified uh, industrial society within 20 years. Keep in mind, today it's only 33 million. <laughs> um, now, he was ousted as well um, in a coup d'etat that was run by the, the Roundtable Group which was a, uh, an organization set up by the, the funds of Cecil Rhodes that had recently just passed, he'd passed away. He was a diamond magnate in, and imperialist in, in South Africa, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, uh, that whole area. And his funds were put to use in creating not only the Rhodes Scholarship Program, which to this day has contaminated and brainwashed a lot of really talented young people around the world for, for, for over a century, but also a series of think tanks uh, that originated with the roundtable movements, which were all designed to create reinstate a world empire under the British command um, and recapture the lost colonies of the United States. That's in, in Rhodes's 1877 uh, Confessions of Faith Will. That was sort of the manifesto of his his organization. So this group- yeah, you, had a, you had a great quote in there that I wasn't even aware of from yeah. Malthus. You know, the, you know, the whole Malthusian idea that- uh, populations grow geometrically and food only grows linearly or whatever and therefore yeah. you've got to call the population every once in a while yeah. so i'm just going to read this quote because i thought it was so good malthus this is right out of your book malthus stated so cold-bloodedly in his 1799 essay on population we should facilitate instead of foolishly and vainlessly endeavoring to impede the operations of nature in producing this mortality. And if we dread the too frequent visitation of the horrid form of famine, we should sedulously encourage the other forms of destruction which we compel nature to use. In our towns, we should make the streets narrower, crowd more people into the houses and court the return of the plague. Why does that <laughs> ring a bell? Like uh, we got the plague yeah. back today. Well, I, you know, I don't want to get too far into conspiracy <laughs> theories, but I think that was remarkable that he said. And then from there, you have the whole Darwinian. Well, anyway, you can pick up the thread if you want at that point or not. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's, that's a whole juicy thought uh, experiment right there. But yeah, like, uh, Malthus people will often say, oh, but he was just a, a, a mathematical philosopher and an economist. Um, that has no, no bearing necessarily on politics. And it's like, no, I'm sorry. This is 1799. The man was working at the British Haleybury College, which trained all of the British East India Company directors, economists, everybody, John Stuart Mill, uh, you know, the Benthamites, everybody came through and were processed in Haleybury College under Malthus that that was like the organizing principle that the of empire 
So yeah, that, that was directly that a direct political application. And the idea was, yeah, uh, that the, the, the only thing, the only, the primary responsibility for the overlords of society managing the world was to know that always human beings are these hedonistic little eating pollution pooping machines that will always reproduce themselves at a faster rate than nature can um, provide for. And thus you can sort of mathematically determine approximately when the crisis point will happen when our population will overexceed our ability to sustain it. And we can act before that happens responsibly as good social engineers to use as Malthus directly said in his essays on population that you quoted from um, these various gifts that the Lord has given us. And he was a, a, a parson. He was a reverend. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> gifts, li- the, the Lord has given us great gifts to uh, regulate uh, the, the herd and cull it according to, you know, wars, famine, disease, the, the, you know, and, and not occur. So all of this is very nasty. Now, the problem is, scientifically, it wasn't taking off because the American experience during the 1800s, especially under Alexander Hamilton's system of the protective tariff, national banking, large scale projects like the, uh, the Erie Canal, which was the biggest infrastructure project in history at that time, was proving that Malthus was wrong. And when you do things a certain way in your political economy, people can get smarter, you can make more discoveries, and you can apply those discoveries to new inventions and technologies that allow you to overexceed to break those carrying capacities of nature, those limits, right? Um, And you can create new resources when you apply things like electricity uh, that was formerly when you were ignorant of electricity, it was just something that dominated you and burnt your houses down. When you became knowledgeable about the nature of electricity, you could then utilize it and it could be incorporated into the productive process. Um, That totally changed the formula and it changed your relationship with the periodic table of elements. Well, that came later under Mendeleev, but the point is it changed our relationship to nature and we could have more people at a higher quality of life, living longer, living happier, more use of their minds, less use of their, their physical b- bodies uh, that, the, you know, that, you know, we're not physically that different from animals uh, like monkeys and stuff um, <laughs> yeah. physically. So anyway, you brought up Darwin. And so when you start looking at where does Darwin come from? I mean, his book on the origins of species was 1859. Malthus wasn't taking off very well. If people were like, well, if we if we do things, yeah, the way the British Empire wants us to do, yeah, the, the Malthus principle works or it, it, it applies. But if we do things this other way that we see coming out of the United States, all of a sudden we find, you know, the U.S.'s population quadrupled in 40 years from 1790 to 1830. So it doesn't work anymore. The formula breaks. So people weren't buying it. They were believing that there was something divine in the mind of humankind that was an infinitely tappable resource that you could continuously develop and and grow without necessarily any physical limits. The mind is an immaterial metaphysical thing, right? That's where justice, ideas of truth that are not something you could break into parts exist. And we can apply it with effects in the the material world, which is a great philosophical problem. Um, but and that's the foundation of the American system. When you read Alexander Hamilton's writings or Henry C. Carey or Lincoln, they're they're always talking about that. Uh, it's very clear and electric in their minds. It's it's, it's not an, an ambiguous thought like it is today for many people. Um, mm-hmm. So Darwin, we're told, you know, he's this great genius, and he he discovers like a new law organizing the evolution of species. I mean, many people had still thought of the Bible as sort of a literalist thing, and and that species just all came into being. What you have now is all that's ever been. But not all. I mean, there are a lot of scientists, you know, there's people like James Dwight Dana, uh, Benjamin Silliman, uh, American. These were great American scientists tied to the Alexander von Humboldt networks of scientists around the world who were all also looking at the fact that, yes, there, there seem to be these fossils, that species disappear, new species come to being. And there was a fight over, is it random? Is it ba- What's the principle that causes new species to come online and old species to disappear? People like James Dwight Dana were, were zeroing in on principles like directionality, like uh, uh, cephalization was one example, was one concept that there was always an increasing, the, the unifying uh, uh, process in biology was that the, you, you would find species capable of more sovereign control of having a centralized prefrontal cortex and neurological system that would be organized in the head 
that would then organize the, the body in, in ways that were, again, directional. It wasn't just random mutations governed by, like what Darwin would say would be, you have random mutations in the, in the small, somewhere down there, just causing changes randomly, like rolling the dice, kind of like what, what Adam Smith says the free markets are. It's, you know, you get random hedonistic desires uh, of people who want to maximize pleasure and avoid pain. And then you have these organizing principles organized by hidden hands that create wealth, that create creative leaps, but it's very, very mystified. And that was sort of the Darwinian idea too, is, you know, you have these random mutations and governed by these desires to hedonistically, for creatures to um, have sex, spread their seed, beat out the weaker in the diminishing race for uh, food and, and, and sex in an environment that's constantly being re reduced of its abundance by the existence of living things. And out of that tension that's caused by various species racing in a, in a world of diminishing returns, you have the certain attributes like, you know, the growth of a slightly longer ta talon or claw will then win out to kill the weaker species that don't have that long mm -hmm. claw or longer beak. And, uh, and that will gradualistically cause species that are weaker to, to go extinct as the, the survival of the fittest spreads itself over the, the system. Darwin, Darwin's saying directly in his autobiography that he got his theory from reading Thomas's Malthus's theory on populations, and that gave him the germ seed to develop his theory, and that itself just was used to justify empire and empire's ability to rape and destroy weaker countries and weaker people and nations as it spread itself around the world. Just to finish that thought, that was ultimately- Yeah, okay, and I'll just add one. I know that, yeah. um, you know, I've read different people that uh, cooperation is actually, actually works better in nature yes. than, than, the, than the dog eat dog sort of basic principle of Darwinian evolution. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, agreed. <laughs> Um, so you talked about various revolutions that, well, like the French Revolution, and it failed. And why did it fail? It had a, it also had a monetary component. That's my first chapter. Is the the American Revolution was an international revolution, which was only made possible by Benjamin Franklin's international networks stretching not only from Prussia and Germany and especially France, where Franklin, you know, he was the ambassador to France for a very long time, but also Russia. Uh, the American Revolution itself was an international revolution, and the f the idea was that after it was a success in America, it was going to spread to first France, where there was a very strong Republican network uh, organized by Ben Franklin uh, that was going to put this into action as a springboard into the rest of Europe in order to liberate Europe as a whole from the system of hereditary controls. Um, unfortunately, after the tennis court oath, and that was going good in, in 1789 under Jean-Sylvain Bailly, who was known as the Ben Franklin of Europe, of uh, France, and he was the world's leading astronomer. Uh, he was the mayor of, of Paris, and he was the head of the tennis court oath, the National Assembly that had organized sort of the uh, Declaration of Independence of a sort in France. And you had people like Lavoisier, the chemist, and many others working as leaders of this, this grouping. Unfortunately, it turned very quickly into a Jacobin anarchist bloodbath. And um, there's been a lot of research done. I cited from some of it regarding people like Robespierre, Danton, Marat, and others of the Jacobin uh, controllers who were directly tied to British intelligence and who had uh, essentially turned this positive potential into anarchy, which resulted very quickly in the lopping off of the heads of all of the great Republican revolutionaries including Bailly and, and Lavoisier and many others. And it eventually, just without any leadership that was able to keep their heads that were qualified, um, it turned into five years of Jacobins who were basically the believers in the wisdom of the mob, the uneducated mob. And it was very antagonistic to anybody who professed themselves to be amongst or categorizable by the elites. And then on the other hand, the Girondins, who were the groups organized around the elites who are saying, look at what happens when you let the mob just rule. It just causes devastation on every level. Let's get control back. And they imposed the 10 day week and uh, the decimal system for everything, including the year. And it was very, very absurd Cartesian response of just, you know, we have to use pure logic now to restore order. And they killed a bunch of Jacobin leaders. The Jacobins took back control. They killed a bunch of Giro days. It was a disaster. And in the vacuum of leadership, it could only be filled by a, a fascist, essentially, uh, in the form of Napoleon. <laughs> Napoleon. 
um, who ran roughshod over Europe for 20 years, which resulted in the destruction of a lot of the Republican movements in Poland, in Ireland, um, and elsewhere that had many of these, these groups, including in po the Polish leaders, as well as the Irish leaders were working in with the Continental Congress during the American Revolution. And they lost everything uh, by the late 1790s. Yeah. So it was a British operation to destroy and disrupt this positive potential from manifesting itself in Europe. There was also a financial aspect that the same bankers came in and did the usual IMF sort of. Essentially, there was a free trade agreement worked out with the um, Philippe Galité um, and the finance minister of France. They basically worked out a British free trade agreement that gave Britain the rights to purchase a lot of the or all essentially as much as they, they wanted of the uh, wheat and grain of France. France was not allowed under this uh, 1786 free trade agreement. They were not allowed to use protective tariffs, basically the free market. They, they did all that because they were in debt, right? I mean, they agreed they were to all highly this. indebted. Yeah, they're yeah, highly indebted. Okay. So the same same situation as we have today with particularly with um, underdeveloped countries. Exactly. Yeah. And, and they were able to, to take advantage of France's massive indebtedness uh, they, there was speculation against the French currency as well as economic warfare was concerned. They, they were able to purchase all of the grain reserves so that France had nothing if a, a harsh winter were to hit, which is exactly what happened. Um, that resulted in the 1789, uh, there's destruction of food crops. They had no food backups and the population was easily now hungry and used as a battering ram to storm the Bastille, um, which was an inside job in many ways, uh, kind of similar to 9-11. So, and we avoided that in the U.S. by printing money, right? By printing our own currency, the continental currency. And that's when Franklin said, isn't it amazing, <laughs> you know, that they, these uh, poor colonists won a war against the world's major superpower mm -hmm. without any money, just by printing their own. So why didn't the French do that, right? Was that just a new concept that <laughs> hadn't been tried? Well, I, I think that there was a lack of, of uh, proper leadership. Marquis de Lafayette, who was really responsible. He could have done the most good um, and understood this Hamiltonian principle the most. Um, he was incapable, though he loved the Republican cause, he was incapable of breaking from his nobility and his, his affinities or loyalties to the royalty. So even though in Spain you had a national land bank, you, start, you sort of had a national bank under King Carlos in the 1780s, who was, I mean, no king during that time can be said to be good, but he definitely wasn't your typical king, King Carlos, and he was the, the brother of uh, Marie Antoinette. Um, but he did care about the people. He's one of those types of kings who actually did care. And he utilized with a Republican network in, in Spain who were preparing to do something similar as what was going on in France. Th these were all very connected networks, sometimes operating through Freemasonic networks that were not part of the British Empire uh, for passing intelligence and coordination um, as a matter of it's just you had to have those things. But uh, he had a national bank that was investing in sort of like Hamiltonian style credit. It was then known as, they wouldn't call it that, it was called dirigism. That was what Hamilton had modeled his system around was Colbert's dirigism of France after the Thirty Years' War um, to basically direct credit from the treasury instead of into wars or speculation, you direct it into the public good, building schools, building canals, building roads and other things, you know. So the idea is infusing real value by increasing the physical qualities of life of the people by making money work and, and serve the purpose of the nation. So and that's that what, was actually money that was just created on the spot or it was loans that were sovereign credit that was created? Loans. So they were, they were creating both, they were directing treasury, uh, their, their treasuries towards uh, action and development, but also you had the growth under Colbert of debts that were tied to future projects. So you could say that that was the creation of debts, but the debt wasn't just a passive debt that was becoming inflationary. It was tied to an anti-inflationary um, physical economic process. Uh, and in, in the case of France, it was the, the great canal building projects of the late 1600s that we saw, you know, um, do this. But it took on much, much more coherent form with Hamilton, of course, as the most scientifically advanced expression of that to our very date, you know. Yeah. And uh, I mean, today, I think we should do that and could do that. But of course, the big objection is it's going to be inflationary, et cetera. I mean, they are doing The Fed has done it, but they're not yeah. doing they're not putting the money into productivity. That's the thing we haven't tried is to print the money for 
public purposes that are actually productive. I mean, we have printed the money and handed it over to people for unemployment and then they don't work, which hasn't been a real good solution either. But we no. haven't tried just printing the money and building stuff, which is, you know, like building the Erie Canal. That obviously worked very well or the Transcontinental Railroad. That's yeah, exactly. Really yeah, it works every time. You, you've seen examples of that in history. You see it even today. I mean, people will criticize China for many things, but even somebody who's anti-China like Tucker Carlson has to admit, and he did admit this week, you know, in a show that I, I found pleasurable to watch, that like China's at the very least able to build things. They stop speculation on housing. They see housing as places where, where people live. They use money for investments in big projects like the Yangtze Three Quarters Dam that brings abundance of electricity to people who need it and reduces all sorts of uh, ailments of, of people that don't have electricity. Whether it's in the present, whether it's in the past, whether it's Lincoln or whether it's Hamilton or whoever, every time this is died, it works. Empires lose their control <laughs> over the system. Um, people become more free, happier. They live longer. They live better quality, quality lives. Um, and money becomes increasingly recognized as simply a creation of the human mind designed for the purpose of serving human needs and not being something we worship in some weird fetishistic -y way. It's a technology. We created it and it could either dominate us or at least those who control the central banks could dominate us using our belief in money um, as a new cult religion of the, the modern age, or we can just use it for doing things we all need as, as people, right? Right. And um, you, you've linked the understanding the trifold nature of the deep state. It's the same British imperial complex that has been trying to undo the watershed moment of 1776 for over 240 years. In other words, the deep state that we have today that's undermining things is what's been going on for a couple hundred years. Do you want to, can you explain that? Like, it's pretty obvious we've got something insidious going on here. And, I would uh, say, Ellen, that we we infuse dignity and rigor into the word conspiracy again, because you've got <laughs> that rap. And uh, <laughs> I honestly, I uh, I think that you can't really understand anything principled or causal about history if you, if you don't look at intentions uh, by groups. Right, well, and conspiracies are the most interesting thing going on. I mean, all through history. I mean, you want to know what was really happening. What motivated that? Who's, what are the underlying forces that are bringing that about? But you're saying the same forces are messing things up today. And yeah, sure. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, there's a continuity uh, that transcends individual lives. And that's tough for people because they think often, yeah, people can only conspire to get something immediately satisfying for them personally, but it's impossible to think how a conspiracy could transcend a life or multiple lives. Number one, to answer that in the short way, read my book um, or my <laughs> series of books um, on the clash of the two Americas. But yeah, the for good or for bad, there are conspiracies. Conspiracies aren't always bad. There are sometimes and oftentimes they are good. Uh, based upon an idea like, for example, Augustine's City of God was or part of an idea that a human society could be brought online that would be capable of breaking from the past imperial traditions um, that were in defiance of natural law. And it could be based upon laws that were in conformity with natural law, uh, which Augustine called God's law, which were premised around a moral principle that, that you know, your laws had to serve the moral needs of society and that, thus they would be good. Otherwise, they would be seen as a form of violence. And that was made by both Augustine and also later on Thomas Aquinas, who made that argument that a law that is because laws are made by human beings, right? You got good laws, you got bad laws. How do you judge? Martin Luther King Jr. talks about this a lot. Does it conform to the moral truths of nature, which require that human beings live life without fear of the future, fear of want, fear of, you know, the future, fear of starving, fear of war? all human beings want to survive. They want their children to live a better life than they did. That's a part, whether you're Indian or African or, or Native American or, or, or Caucasian, whatever, that's an invariant of all sort of healthy, mature human beings. So if a law is infringing on that, it's a form of violence. It's not legit. It doesn't square with God's law. You can say the same thing about technology, but I mean, all these great technologies they've come up with that they could be using against us 
Yeah. Well, even including financial, you know, there's a lot of scary things going on in the financial architecture out totally. there. Yeah, but totally. they could also be used to serve the people, you know. So, exactly. so yeah, the exactly. trick is how do we capture it in the public yeah. interest? I mean, I think that was the trouble with pulling off the, I mean, the unfinished symphony. I think the part that, that's so hard to do is how do you get all these people to if you have a government of the people by the people for the people they're all sovereign and mm-hmm. they all want something how do you harmonize all their interests into a set of laws that spared to everyone lincoln was also a lawyer but he lived in a, a very different world that understood justice as a real principle and not just something you use as a word to win your fights or win your cases like a like a boxing match that was one of the, the first lessons that our our, our criminal law t- uh, teacher taught us First thing that matters that you all have to keep in mind throughout the rest of your life, whether you become a defense or a a prosecution lawyer, is justice doesn't matter. It's can you win your case? (laughs) That was our first law. (laughs) Lesson number one. (laughs) I'm like horrified. But how many students are walking out of there thinking that that's that's the lesson that they're going to take with them, right? In Lincoln's mind or in Cicero, the, the great lawyer Republican of Rome who was trying to stop Rome from becoming an empire, whose head was cut off by by Mark Antony. In their minds, law must serve justice, just like a good economist like uh, Henry C. Carey or Hamilton understands that economics must serve justice, which is all different aspects of the same thing. I think if we started teaching our kids uh, and, and really teaching ourselves, reminding ourselves of these realities, culturally, you, you could get an upshift where people could then navigate through the, the minefield of misinformation, false theories that are that are given to them and, and have an internal litmus test inside their soul to say, okay, this is a theory I'm, to- I'm being told by experts and authorities is something I should adopt as my own, my program, my, you know, as if I was a human computer or blank slate, but does it pass the litmus test of, of my internal understanding of justice, my internal conscience and my soul? No, yeah. oh, it fails. Oh, people will be hurt if I do this. Maybe that's actually a bad theory. Let's, let's look for a better theory that doesn't hurt people. Like whatever macroeconomic theories are taught in in school today, right? That legitimize austerity and, and hurting or killing millions of people at the stroke of a pen to pay off unpayable or illegitimate debts that can and should never be paid on behalf of a financier oligarchy. Instead of building just water projects or other things that would just make their lives better and then also pay off whatever debts are legit by building something of real value. So mm-hmm. yeah, you just gotta get people to think in a different, more critical and moral yeah. geometry. My hope is that we're in an age of enlightenment. You know, we have the ability to understand people all around the world, which we never could do before. Like with the internet today, sure, you could say that there's bad elements because there's so much noise and distraction um, that takes people off of a productive path. You, you, you have to do the work and, and be more critical. And it requires more responsibility on our minds part individually to not be passive, but be active researchers. And also the thing I would have discovered that helps me and helps people in my network uh, do this with more resilience is having an intention to communicate and teach, to be a transmitter of it, and not just a receiver, a consumer alone, right? Otherwise, otherwise people get exhausted. They get sort of overwhelmed and burnt out by it. And people like Alexander Hamilton or Benjamin Franklin and many others following in their traditions were very much concerned with the aesthetical development of the people as well, which is why you had the investment, federal investments into fine arts institutions, uh, music. Um, This was all over the 19th century, especially this was part of FDR's New Deal was investments into the arts, drama, Shakespeare, uh, all of that. So that's the soul of the economy. Just having a a materialistic system is is very mechanical and it, it kind of lends you into a technocracy or fascism. Um, and it doesn't give you the creative juice you need to overcome the limits to growth either. I think that we're, we're in a civilizational crisis. And I think anybody who's listening to your show has an intimation of that already. Um, if I believe that there is something very beautiful, obviously, to be saved inside of the United States that could be used as a, uh, a, 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 a beacon, something very beautiful that could lend itself to the aspirations of the world for a new type of system based upon cooperation and harmony and brotherhood. Uh, for for the future as well as for the present. Um, It can be saved. It's worth saving. And I say that just because I talk to a lot of people who are gloating foolishly about the imminent collapse of the bubble economy USA empire. And they don't think through, I think, not only this beautiful history that's been 
kept from us, but also the implications of what that means, the amount of death that that's going to entail of a collapse into a, a, a dark age, which is just devastatingly bad. I mean, to really think about that, it's, it's unacceptable. So there is something there. Humanity is an unfinished process. It will never be a finished process uh, because there's always going to be more to discover. The universe is really, uh, I mean, it's bigger than we could possibly imagine. And, uh, and we need a type of political, economic, legal system and philosophy and culture that is in harmony with the existing laws, not just of today, but also of what we're going to be facing going into the future where, I mean, we have so many dangers that are beyond simply the danger of nuclear war, which is a real danger. But I mean, as guaranteed asteroids are going to hit the earth at different times in the future. Are we going to be prepared for that or not? Uh, we're going to have sunspot activity sh shutting down uh, electronic grids on the earth like it did in, in 1989 in Quebec. We lost electricity all over Quebec when a sunspot hit the uh, our, our grid head on. Um, that was devastating. It could be even much worse. So are we putting into effect decisions today that allow us to prepare for, to create new technologies, to foresee and then intervene upon asteroids and other things like that, oncoming ice ages? Or are we just sitting here like idiots fighting over diminishing returns of resources while we uh, go into, you know, unend unending wars with maybe Russia or China, um, like idiots. It's, it's, it's completely uh, a joke if we, if we, we don't, you know, it's, it's, it's so absurd. So anyway, I'm hoping that people will take this crisis as an opportunity, like the Chinese say, it's the same word, right? Crisis opportunity um, to not just discover some history, but then to change their paradigm in accordance with some ne necessities and, you know, you've been putting forth the, the program for a national banking system on, on state and federal levels for a long time. Every country can do this. Every country can take back its sovereign controls of its economy, of its banking. It could eliminate unpayable debts that are illegitimate and will, are, will never be paid and turn whatever legitimate debts do exist into productive credit like Hamilton did, like Lincoln did, like FDR did for the development needs of our society. We can all do that. That's very accessible. Uh, some countries are already doing things like that. Like, and again, people might not like China, but I don't care. China is doing things like that already as a role model in our world, building massive infrastructure by turning debt into something useful. So, all right. Great talking to you. Thank you so much for all your insights. Very helpful and very interesting. I've been speaking with Matthew Eret, who is editor in chief of the Canadian Patriot Review a prolific author and lecturer. His latest book is called The Clash of Two Americas, Volume 1, The Unfinished Symphony. And his website is canadianpatriot.org and you can find his books there. Well, that's it for this edition of It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. Our thanks to our guests, our sponsor, Public Banking Associates, and to you for listening. Be sure to check out Ellen's latest writings on the economy and the changing world of money by visiting ellenbrown.com. And for more information on public banking, visit publicbankinginstitute.org. For information on how local and state government leaders can obtain professional insight and counsel about public banks from key national experts, visit publicbankingassociates.com. I'm Walt McCree. See you next time on It's Our Money with Ellen Brown.